So, Cougar fans out there? Any Eastern fans out there? Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that game for, for it was close. And uh, my son went to that game with Jonathan. I think Jonathan made it back. God bless him and stuff. So, uh, it's interesting to see how, in, with college football, how many neat traditions there are. And that we always connect, if we've, you know, to a team. And we connect ourselves to a, a mascot. Today we're going to do communion. And I want to connect us with this symbol of this lamb. This would be God's mascot to a certain extent. Jesus Christ's mascot before eventually he changes it in the, old, in the New Testament to a lion. But we always kind of have this pride in our mascots. You know, if you you know, enroll in UW or you're a UW family or something like that, all of a sudden purple means something to you. Dogs are important to you. You don't like cats anymore. Cougars, you can't stand, that kind of stuff. Flip side, you know, if you're on the other side of the state and you're wearing crimson, it really, you know, you start doing all spiritual analogies on us and stuff. It's Jesus' team, that thing. And then, you know, of course, if you live down in Oregon, you, you know, you are a fan of the greatest animal ever, you know, the duck that can run and walk and swim. No other animal in the animal kingdom can do all three, you know, and fly. So just thought I'd tell you that. But, you know, they all have imagery, but if the heavenlies look down at us, uh, they may look at symbols and say, so you're a Seahawks fan. What's it mean? And we're like, go Seahawks, dude. Go Seahawks. You know, and yet if an angel came and said, well, well is there a meaning behind Seahawks? What do you mean? And I go, well, have you ever seen a Seahawk? I guess so, maybe. Everyone flies, you know, over the football stadium and comes down on some. No, that's the War Eagles. I don't, I don't know. There's a guy that raises the flag, you know, at the beginning of the game. We all go crazy. And you wear all this Seahawk stuff, but you don't really know what a Seahawk is. Have you ever seen a cougar? If you do, you usually want to run really fast. You don't want to hang around and hug the cougar or anything like that, you know, or anything like that. And so all of a sudden, you know, and I'm sure God would talk to me about a duck, you know, that's like, wimpy you know and besides he's from disney that kind of stuff you know so we're all have this pride in these apps we put on our phone and everything else my my wife isn't a huge sports fan and she doesn't claim the duck she tells me to eliminate that out of my messages every single time so that i can have friends i don't have any um but she has her own app and she's pretty proud of it it's it's the sunshine app you know she looks at the weather channel and she actually roots for sunny days i don't know if you're aware of this but there are were, or according to Valerie, because it's still on the records, 47 sunshiny days in a row. And, and so, like, this is a big deal. This is like, you know, beating LSU in Baton Rouge or something like that. Because the record in the Northwest is 51 days. And so she's like, this is a huge deal to her. And so I, I, I was a little bit cruel, but it was starting to sprinkle outside our house. I go, honey, it's, you see that on the windshield? She goes, what, what, what? I go, rain on the windshield. She looks at it like denial at first. No, she's just crushed by defeat. And then she finds out, you know, this is from the airport, and so it's still on record. She's kind of rooting for this. This is a big deal to her, and she can't, we're going to have victory, and, a, you know, we're going to have food and everything else. We're going to invite you over to look at the sunshine or something like that on day 51. Is that what we're going to do? So we all have these imageries that mean something to us. The interesting thing, when we look at communion, I don't know about you growing up, but my dad was a deacon, which meant elder in this Baptist church of ours. We would put that tray up here, and then there would be this big throne where the senior pastor sat. I don't get one, but in my, my church, there was this big old chair, bigger than everyone else's, and he got to sit there, and, and then they had chairs on the stage this way and that way, and the elders sat there, the deacons, and then we would talk about the communion really briefly and read the Bible and then pass out these silver trays that you would never eat on. We have them too. And that's because that's the way it's always been done. And for me, I don't know about you, but sometimes when it comes to communion, there seems to be somewhat of um, a mystery. Kind of like maybe Jesus is asking us, what's a Seahawk? We might be turning around and saying, what's with these elements? Why grape juice or wine uh, that means blood and why bread that doesn't taste very good because you only get a very little small amount anyway. And, and what's this mean? And, I, and so today we're going to start back in the book of Exodus. And Exodus is a story about how God can. It's, it's called redemption. Uh, the story of God starts in Genesis. And we looked at this last week about how man, although in their, his best behavior, even Abraham, pretty good guy, Joseph, really good guy, man can't. That was the story. And the whole theme of the book of Genesis is that man can't. And all of a sudden, we have this, this next book called Exodus. And Exodus starts, and it runs all the way to almost to the book of Revelation, that, but God can. It's the theme of the Bible. Man can't, but God can. And when God comes, and he, he 
he shows himself to be, we're going to look today at the most important word picture in the entire Bible, Exodus chapter 11 and 12. And it's about God talking about his mascot, in a sense, of who God is. And we're going to look at Jesus who chooses to be called, or the Messiah in the Old Testament, the Lamb is coming, the Lamb is coming, the Lamb is coming. And they're just, to this day, there's this Passover meal that is anticipating this Messiah to come in, in Israel. If you're a really good Jew, you are still waiting on the Messiah. And they're waiting, according to Isaiah, about this lamb. And then someday, Isaiah says he'll be a lion, a lamb and a lion, a lamb and a lion. What's that mean? And so today, we're going to look at Exodus chapter 11, and we're going to look at this this meal that started because of Israel being stuck in Egypt, stuck in sin, stuck in this, this arena of, of evil, this country representing sin like no other, other than maybe America, uh, and all kinds of sin. And, and so God says, I am going to redeem Israel. And so I'm going to send a deliverer. And so the first, not third of the book, but, but the first section of redemption is really about a deliverer coming. Now, the deliverer's name is Moses, and he tries it on his own, and he finds out, just like in all the other stories in the book of Genesis, man can't. And so he runs off on his own, and so for 40 years, he's a king, and the other 40 years, he's a shepherd, and God calls him to be a shepherd king to this country called Israel. Not yet a country, but soon to be, once they cross the Red Sea. And so Moses comes back, and he is taking on the word picture of sin, the nation of Egypt. And Egypt has sin after sin after sin. And Moses has no clue how many, but we're going to look at nine of these. We did even last year. And every one of them alludes to a national sin, sexual sins, materialistic sins, one after the other. And, and Moses keeps going to Pharaoh and saying, let my people go. If not, here comes a plague. And a plague comes. Pharaoh repents, says he's sorry. Stop the plague. I'll let you go. And so when this plague stops, Pharaoh changes his mind. He changes his mind not once, but twice, not three, not four, not five, not six, not seven, not eight, nine times. God is an amazing God. And if you don't think he's patient with your sin, read all of the book of Exodus. At least read all of the plague stories. You get a little bored with God. When are you going to like deal with them? God's the same with us in our sin. How long-suffering God is, waiting on us to come. And so finally, God says, this is the last time, Moses. And Moses, in all his boldness, says to Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, I am done with you. And Moses, not backing up, just like David with Goliath, says, no, I'm done with you. The pretty amazing passage. It's almost like this boxing mano a mano, and Moses takes on Pharaoh. And he says, let me tell you what will happen. And he says, you and all your country will have every firstborn child will be judged by God. Meaning firstborn was always the most important back when. Back when, all the inheritance, everything. So everything, even the next king of Egypt will be taken out. Firstborn, everyone. Act everyone in the entire land, unless God redeems you. And so this beautiful story of Passover is about God the Lamb word picture, and it means something. It's not just a Seahawk that's flying across the nation or something like that that we don't quite understand. And there's this picture of this Passover story, and it eventually becomes a national holiday for Israel. Bigger than anything else is Passover. Bigger than anything else. And it's, it's something unlike anything we celebrate. Um, most of our holidays, even our religious ones, Christmas and Easter, generally look back to what happened. Christmas, Jesus was born. Easter, Jesus died and rose again. But rarely do we celebrate something going that way in the future. Passover was designed to say, God took care of the nation of Israel in its earliest days, but the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, and it's just like this anticipation celebration. They'll do a whole thing, the, uh, a Seder, which is the meal of Passover, is this, everything is about the Messiah coming. The Messiah coming. They send the little boy out, who's to be Elijah, out, outside kind of as a little play. And he'll go look all around. He's not there yet. The forerunner's not there, meaning the, John the Baptist. The Messiah's coming. Messiah's coming. And there's this anticipation. We don't really have a holiday that way. Birthdays, sort of. The only thing I can really, you know, I really wrestled with this I could think of is when my kids were little munchkins, they had, and I think they're coming back now, the Disney store. You all remember the Disney store when you had little munch? And uh, 
you know, Becca was, you know, like oh, six and four or something like that. And so we're taking them to the Disney store, and they just think it's the coolest thing. The coolest thing. You know, I hated going to the mall. We tried to avoid the Disney store because we could never get out of the mall. So, you know, if you knew one was there and you didn't want to tell the kids, you just try to say, like, where's the Disney store? Avoid that, that corridor or whatever. And you try to go around it. But eventually they, they would know. They could just smell it. They'd see some kid with ears on or something like that and, or, you know, a beloved duck or something like that. And they'd want to go to the Disney store. Sorry, quack, quack. So, so here they go in the Disney store. And, and we, you know, that year we're planning to go to Disneyland. And so... I thought I'd cast vision, being the visionary that I am. And I said, can you see this? And they go, yeah. And I go, you know what Disneyland's like? No, what's Disneyland like? I go, Disneyland is like this entire mall being the Disney store. And their eyes are just you know, so cool, so excited. They can't wait. Unfortunately, I didn't really check with mom. And I told them about two months before we were ever going to go to Disneyland. So every single morning, we're going to Disney store? Busy? Becca would get up. It's a Disney, you know, they have no sense of time. So they think it's tomorrow, you know? Pretty soon they nag you to death and you're going, you're not going to Disneyland, you hear that? You know, and then you repent and say you're sorry and let the kid go to Disneyland or something like that. But there's this anticipation. I don't know if you remember that, but for me as a kid, I didn't live near Disneyland, so I was this, couldn't wait. And then it was everything you dreamed of. That's Passover. Passover is that kind of celebration that they would come and say the Messiah is going to come and take care of our woes and our worries and our pains and our sorrows. And it hurts. And Passover was implemented for that reason. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 11. And we're going to do today what I call is a biblical theology. This is really cool. You can press everyone. What would you learn today? Oh, we went a biblical theology. We went from the entire Bible and the theology of what it means to be saved. And so today we're going to talk about the Passover, the story of how God passed over the sins of Israel. And then we're going to tie that into what Jesus eventually implements, these funny-looking containers up here, which was really a meal. If you really wanted to do Passover and or communion right, we wouldn't do it fast. Uh, my favorite communions are not in a big service with lots of people. And there's a little dinky cup. I mean, is that going to get you, you know, thirst quench? You know, a little thing like that? I'm sorry, but we rip you off. You know, and a little cracker that you can barely see. And that's done in, out, you know, very American, American McDonald's-like. Uh, that was not this. The implementation, if we really did it right, we'd have this full-on meal. And then Jesus grabbed one element and another, and we're going to talk about that at the end. And there's this amazing, understandable word picture. Way better than Seahawks, dogs, or cougars and huskies. So let's, uh, let's look at this Passover, and we're going to look at five elements of the Passover, and it will tie in theologically to us and communion today, okay? And the very first element of Passover was there was a lamb, and the lamb was needed. God's mascot, the lamb. And a lamb was needed. Moses says this to Israel, uh, Exodus 11, verse 5 and 6. So Moses says, thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. Bad news, right? From the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl. I think this is really interesting. Who is behind the hand mill? God knows where every single firstborn is. When it comes judgment time, God knows where you are every single time and where you're at. And all the firstborn of the cattle, there shall be a great cry throughout the land of Egypt, as there has never been or never will be again. God says a lamb is needed. Uh, we will die because of our sins. Um, New Testament theology says in Romans, for all have sinned in what? And fall what? Short. Short of the glory of God. That's the bad news. God is about good news, but that is the bad news. Uh, pretty much a fact, you know, as I drive by cemeteries, I, I always said this since I was little with my kids. You see that cemetery over there? And they go, yeah, and I go, people are dying to get in there. <laughs> I've told you that joke like five times. You still don't laugh over it. None of you get it. You're slow. Uh, and the Bible also talks about, so we're all dying. We're all dying. You ever tried to live forever? We all do. You know, there's things to try to help you, but it's not going to do any good. For the wages of the sin in us is death. You need a lamb. You need a lamb. A lamb is needed, but the gift of God is eternal light. In the Bible, the theology in John, Jesus speaks about the Lamb of God is here, right? And, you know, John the Baptist says, and he says, look, flesh gives birth to flesh, meaning you're born, you, you live and you die. 
And that's, that's it. That's the life you have. But spirit gives birth to spirit, meaning you need to be born again. And, and John, speaking to Nicodemus in John 3, saying is you need to be born again. John 3, 16 comes out of this passage. Uh, everyone is born once, but spiritually you have to be born twice to know God. And sin is the reason why we need to be born again. In the Passover, a lamb was needed. And so they go look for the lamb. It's a whole, the Seder is a, a whole play and a meal at the same time, like a dinner theater in some ways. But you are the actors while you're eating and you go look for the lamb. Well, the lamb is outside. And not only is there a lamb, a lamb means chosen above all the other lambs. Uh, and so Moses in, tells the people in Exodus 12, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be the beginning of months and it shall be the first month of the year for you and tell all the congregation of Israel on the 10th day of this month, every man shall what? Take a lamb. Lots of lambs? No. 10 lambs? No. Five? No. Four? No. Three? No. Two? No. One. You choose one lamb. You go and choose a lamb and you take it to your household. Your father's household and a lamb of the household. Everyone must go look among all the lambs. This is kind of the Christmas tree thing. Trust me, I've been out there on my knees and wet and cold and everything else. And we got to find the perfect tree. Can't have a thing like this. Can't look like Charlie Brown's tree or anything like that. And trust me, I've got a lot of detailed people in my family. All three of them. No, not that one, Dad. I just want to cut the first tree and get out of there, you know. But they want this tree that looks perfect. And this is what... Israel needed to do when they looked for a lamb it couldn't it couldn't have a blemish at all it needed to have this perfection to it and so it had to be chosen that's the lamb I want not that one not that one that one God has done the same thing for us uh, Peter says look the lamb of God was chosen for you to take care of your sin first Peter 1 20 he Jesus Christ was chosen before the creation of the world whoa you ever thought about that God dealt with your sin before the world was ever created. He was chosen before the world, the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Uh, it says in the earlier part of that chapter of 1 Peter 1 that the prophets look intently with the greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances of this Messiah, Passover. When's he coming? When's he coming? When's he coming? And they couldn't figure it out. But it was revealed to them uh, that they weren't serving themselves at the time, they were serving us in this room. It literally says that in First Peter. Read, read that whole context. And God chose his son to be the lamb. None other. I couldn't do it, you couldn't do it. Mother Teresa, pretty good. She couldn't do it. Abraham, not bad. Joseph, nearly perfect. Joseph's father, the father uh, stepfather of Jesus, really perfect too. Couldn't do it. God chose the only lamb that could deal with our sin problem. And as you look at the lamb chosen, three, there are three issues there. First of all, it was chosen to be slain. Um, here in 1 Peter, it says he, is the, he was chosen to die for us. Uh, secondly, the lamb, when you chose it, had to be spotless. Look in Exodus 2, 5, 12, verse 5, excuse me. The lamb uh, shall be without blemish and a male a year old. First Peter, it says, for you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of, of life, empty way of life handed down to you and your ancestors. Flesh gives birth to flesh, which leads to death. What fulfills you? Only the spirit. But with the precious blood of Christ. And who is Christ? Picture a what? A lamb without blemish or defect. Uh, a, a, chose, a lamb was chosen to be slain out of all the other lambs. A lamb was spotless. And then the third aspect of choosing this land, it was to be tested. Exodus 12, verse 5. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. It was to be tested until the 14th day of the month. Interesting thing is Passover is still celebrated that way. And the Jews have two religious holidays, uh, two holidays, calendars, excuse me, and one is religious, and it starts in the spring. And on the 14th day of that calendar, they kill the lamb. The lamb is slain for, the, for the, the blood representing what happened on Passover. Jesus Christ died in the spring on the 14th day. And all of a sudden, this picture is right there for them. Tested, spotless, and chosen to be slain. A lamb is needed, but a lamb is chosen. Our lamb, Jesus Christ, as we take this meal, 
is chosen for us. And then the third aspect of this meal is the lamb has to be, listen here, has to be slain. Uh, Exodus 12, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight, and then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorsteps and the lintels of the house, kind of the, 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 out, the outstretch of the door there. A living lamb was really a lovely thing, and I don't know about you, but I love to hear the stories of Jesus Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we all have favorite stories, do we not? Walk on the water is pretty cool. You know, you can just see him doing the surf thing or whatever, right? Uh, I mean, all, all kinds of stuff. I love the centurion's faith where he's just amazed that the centurion doesn't even, don't, don't even bother to say the word. My servant will be healed. And Jesus says, healed, healed. Pretty cool, right? Doesn't help us at all. A lamb that lives does not help us. The lamb and the pastor and meal had to be slain or Israel, every firstborn of Israel would have died. It took death sacrificial death for that angel of death to ignore the nation of Israel. And this is critical in this Passover element. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. The righteous, him, the unrighteous, us, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. The lamb was needed, the lamb was chosen but more than anything, it's the blood of Jesus Christ, the death of Christ that allows us to live. Not his life, his death. And the power in his resurrection is why we're here today and can live forever. It's not your life that does good. It's not being religious that says, Jesus was a good person and I want to be like him. And Muhammad was good and I want to be like him. And so-and-so was good and I want to be like him. It took God to figure out what would deal with our sins so that we would not die spiritually? And it took sacrificial death. The lamb was needed, the lamb was chosen, the lamb was slain. And this is an element that kind of gets skipped over with our communion since it's so fast. But, but we do it, it's just kind of we don't think about it. Is the lamb was eaten. Exodus 12 verse 8, And they shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, and they shall eat it. And so this meal had wine, and it had unleavened bread, and it had this lamb, and they would eat the lamb. And the amazing thing about this, this aspect is that, that when they had this meal, it represented Jesus Christ. What's a Seahawk represent? Seattle, I guess. What's a lamb of represent? The Lamb of God, as John the Baptist said, there he is. There's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he comes Jesus, and he is baptized by John. There was identification. And the Lamb meant something. The Lamb of God died for us. The Lamb of God was chosen by God. The Lamb of God lives for us. And so that night, they did nothing. They just put blood on their doorposts and sat and let God do it all. And that is what salvation's about. That's redemption. God does it all. And then in this meal, they ate the lamb. And I always thought this was a little bit, honestly, weird about communion. I don't know if you do too, but, you know, you're drinking grape juice, at least for us, sometimes wine, but it represents blood. And you're eating bread that represents his body. And it, it just seems a little bit, you know, weird sometimes. Until we understand the theology of this is that Jesus isn't around us. That's deism. Uh, Jesus is somewhere out there and I need to call him. I believe in President Obama. I've never met him, right? And if I did, I probably would have to talk to him on the phone and get through a lot of people and he, there had to be some reason to talk to him. And so I'd have to call him, right? Usually or something like that of a distance, but I still believe he exists. But in a sense, like a deist, God's so far away, I'd have to talk to him on a phone. Or he's near me even. I believe in my neighbors. They live next door. I don't always see them, but when we go out and mow, we talk and this and that, right? I see my neighbors, uh, but they're not there all the time. My kids and my, my wife, the same, they're not always with me. But there's this component of this meal when you eat the lamb. Jesus is in us in Christ. Christ is in us. There's an ever presence of Jesus Christ. And then part of the meal was that the bread was to be what is called unleavened. Now, leaven represents one word in the entire Bible. You know what it means, anyone? Sin. Leaven means sin. 
Leaven spreads. You put it in the yeast, the bread rises, it, it spreads. Uh, and the word pig, Israel, they dealt with these. They dealt with sheep all the time. They were all around. They dealt with bread all the time. They dealt with wine. And so these elements at a meal made sense to them. It wasn't just a Seahawk on a t-shirt, okay? This made sense to them. And so as they eat this meal, it's representing this Messiah who's not going to be just close to me or far away. He's going to be in me. I don't know how that works. And all of a sudden, the Messiah comes, dies for us. We trust in him. And it says the Holy Spirit is enhoused in us. We're a tabernacle. We're kind of a house. And God lives in that house. And when we eat the element, listen here, we no longer, we're saying, even in communion, we're saying this about our sin. I am taking in the Holy One the one without blemish, the one who died for me. And in communion, when I take the bread, unleavened bread, bread without sin, I am saying to God in this meal, I want to be like that. Okay? I am saying in this God in this meal is, I understand I blow it, but I want to be like that. I want to be holy. I understand last week, I had issues with gossip. I understand last week I had issues in my sexuality. I understand last week that I had issues with covenanting, with jealousy. I understand those things. And as we come to communion, that's what we at first focus on. (laughs) But not to be bummed out, but to celebrate that the Lamb of God died for you in those issues. And then when you eat the meal, it's a commitment. It's saying, I don't want to do what I did last week. I don't want to do that all. Interesting enough, when Paul alludes to leaven in the New Testament, it's usually around sexual sins. 1 Corinthians 5, don't you know that the whole chapter is about some guy sleeping with his mother-in-law or something like that, the way the, the Greek is. Verse 5, verse 6, uh, chapter 5, verse 6 of 1 Corinthians, do you not know that a little yeast doesn't take much, leavens the whole batch of dough? You like hanging around sin? Good luck because it'll eat you up. And the reason I know this is I know this, okay? We all know this. We hang around sin, it just spreads. It's contagious. Is it fun? Does it taste good? Absolutely. Will it destroy us? Absolutely. Don't you know, a little bit ruins everything? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be new, unleavened batch as you rely on for Christ. And now Paul's going back to the old meal, our Passover, what, lamb, there's our hero, there's meaning in a mascot, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with old bread, leavened with malice and wickedness, Greek words, sexuality words a lot of times in this, in this context. We all sin in areas, and we all struggle usually in the areas of sexuality. What, when we're eating this meal, whenever our sin of choice is that is habitual, we're telling God at communion, I don't want to be like that anymore, Okay? It's a commitment. I'm eating God in me and I want to change. It's a commitment. And so in that commitment, just simply talk to the Holy Spirit. So what do I need to do not to do what I did last week? Isn't this cool? He's not mad at you. He's not saying sinner, sinner, sinner. Trust me, we're all in that boat. We all need the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us. He's just simply saying in this time of reflection without leaven, How are you going to live tomorrow and next week and next month not like last week that had leaven in it? How are you going to eliminate the leaven? And a conversation with the Holy Spirit will help you. I'm not going to read that book. I'm not going to watch that show. I'm going to keep accountable for looking at this. I'm going to avoid this area of the internet, and this is how I'm going to do it. Does this make sense? You have a plan of commitment when you take the body of Christ, the unleavened, holy body of Christ in you, you're committing. I'm not going to want more stuff than I have. I'm not going to talk like I did last week about somebody. I'm not going to not forgive anymore. And as you take communion, as the Israelites took Passover, they ate Christ to be in them. And the word picture was beautiful. And when you eat a meal, I don't know if you know this, in your body, it goes everywhere (laughs) throughout your blood system. And unleavened bread that you will eat, swallow, barely taste, (laughs) 
will do the same. Holiness will be spread. And you're committing in that meal as you eat to be holy. A lamb was needed. A lamb was chosen. A lamb was slain. A lamb was eaten. And the lamb was meant to be celebrated. A lamb was trusted. Uh, Exodus 12. And the people of Israel, they heard this. They saw what God did. And they said, yes, we will celebrate Passover forever. Until the Messiah comes. And then that wonderful day, the Messiah comes the night before his death. And he says, let me change the elements. You see this? You see this wine? It's no longer an anticipation. It's here now. It's Disneyland, not the Disney store. And it represents the blood. And as you drink the cup today, remember how Jesus took away your sins. Do you remember the moment you trusted in Christ for your first time ever? Maybe that's today. Let me get this picture here. Jesus Christ died for you on the cross so that you can live with him forever. The gospel is just simply believing that God, Jesus Christ is God. Not only did he live, but that he died, okay? And then as he died, you're trusting in Jesus to take that sin away. As you eat the element of bread, you're saying, I just want to be like Jesus now the rest of my life. That's what the bread element is. And the Bible just says, whoever believes on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. God is God. Jesus Christ died for you, but because he was God, Satan made a big mistake. He thought he'd stay dead, and not a chance. He rose again. He has power over death. A word picture of power will come next week in the crossing of the Red Sea. Maybe you need to make a decision today about Jesus. Never have before. And as elements are passed, as you drink that cup, it's the very first time in your life that this means something, that Jesus is alive and real. And you're trusting him when you drink the cup as your savior. It's not the cup that's making you saved. It's your belief in your heart. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for by grace are we saved through faith, not through a drink or a bread or anything else, but through faith, by trusting him. This is not of yourself, no works, no boasting. They just sat there. Jesus saved them in the Passover. And that's the element we're going to have. Dane is going to come up and um, we have communion served. And we've done it just slightly different today. Um, we have a cup within a cup, okay? So it, as you look, it just looks like um, uh, the cup of juice. Uh, underneath that juice is another cup. It's stacked on top of each other. So grab two cups, as you pull up, you can just see underneath the cup, the second cup is the, the bread, and you can pull those out. So take both cups, and then you can take them apart, and one is, one is the juice, and the other is the bread. Hold on to those elements, please, and then we will take it all together. But as he uh, sings the meditation for us, I would encourage you where you're at with today with Jesus Christ, maybe for your very first time, that, that blood means something different than religion. It now has meaning. And that Jesus Christ died for you. And by taking that cup today, you're by the very first time saying, I believe, I believe that Jesus Christ is God, that he died for my sins and rose again. Maybe you need to be reminded of that as a Christian and it just kind of lost its meaning and the cup has that meaning today. As we take the bread, uh, Christian, I would really just begin to encourage you as we just listen to the song, to begin to meditate, what did I do last week that I really shouldn't do next week? Where did I blow it last week that I need a friend? Or I need to hear from the Holy Spirit how to avoid that scenario again. What immorality, what sexual sins, what gossip, what coveting, what things that I just need to get out of my life. And as I take the bread, it's not just symbolism, it's not just religion. It's actually going to represent commitment of change. Does that make sense? Um, take some time as, as Dana leads us in meditation for those two elements you're holding them. One for the joyous blood that God took away, the sins of the world, sins, your sins. And the second, the bread, unleavened bread that you're committing to holiness. You spread out the skies over empty space said that there be light to a dark and formless world your life was born you 
In Luke and, and in 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul reflects on the Passover changing, the Passover dinner changing to the communion dinner. And I'd encourage you as small groups someday to take a little bit more time uh, in a communion dinner, uh, having a dinner, having the wine there and having uh, the bread, the unleavened bread. And then um, uh, take some time and just go around and share your testimonies briefly, maybe, about how you came to Christ. Uh, it's the most special day in your life, personally. And how Christ changed your life. Take some time in the bread and just really commit to holiness in your small group that way. And that's what we're doing today. Paul reminds us, and he says, I remember this too, the tradition was an old wood table that says, do this in remembrance of me. There's a present reality, but there's a future reality too. Translation, do this in remembrance of anticipating me, right? That he's coming back. We're in the Disney store right now. But Jesus is going to come and he's going to change the mascot from a lamb to a lion and rule forever. Let's anticipate that. Paul, quoting Jesus, when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. You can imagine that very last supper, <laughs> last Passover supper, very first communion supper. And he grabs the wine. He says, this is representing salvation. This is representing living forever. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and saying, this cup is the new covenant, the new promise in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of for me. For... As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. And then that last phrase, can we read it together? Until he comes. Amen? Let's take the cup together. Until you come, Lord. We believe you're alive and you're real, and so we celebrate until you come. Maranatha, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. Um, and we pray that when you come, our holiness will be greater than last week, last month, this last year. And as we've eaten the bread, we want our lives not to have leaven in it. We want the holiness to take over. God, we celebrate life. and We celebrate what the blood of the Lamb has done. He's taken away the sins of the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.